Just a few days before voting begins to decide the next Labour leader, we're in Dudley North, a Labour seat since its creation in 1997. It was taken by the Conservatives in December as that red wall came tumbling down. With us, the candidates to be the next Labour leader, Rebecca Long-Bailey. She went to Catholic school in Chester and became a solicitor in the North West before her election to Parliament five years ago. Jeremy Corbyn, who she gave 10 out of 10, called her our candidate for leader. Keir Starmer, he got into a state grammar school in Surrey, which went private while he was there. He became a barrister and then head of the Crown Prosecution Service, for which he was knighted. Also elected in 2015, he is the current bookie's favourite to be leader. Lisa Nandy went to comprehensive school in Manchester, worked in politics and the charity sector before her election 10 years ago. Having failed to bring down Jeremy Corbyn's leadership in 2016, she says she now wants to bring Labour home. <laughs> now, our audience tonight is made up of people who voted Labour at the last election, plus party members who will get a vote when the official ballot opens next Monday. And we also have some former Labour voters who the next leader will need to win back if they have any hope of returning the party to power. So let's hear from some of them now. Ian, you left Labour at the last election. Why? What's the problem? I think there was a failure in credible leadership. The policies were too fantastical. Foreign policy felt anti-Western too often, and there was the culture of bullying within the Labour Party. I'm, I'm interested, as a former Labour voter, about who's going to get my vote back. When you, when you say those. lack of credible leader, what do you mean? I don't think the leader was authentic. I don't think he was integral. I don't think he was honest. OK. How about you? I'm Levine. I have been a lifelong uh, Labour supporter who, sadly, voted Conservative this time because of Brexit. I did it with a very heavy heart because my dad was a minor for 50 years, Labour councillor. I went into the ballot box and um, put the X on and said, sorry, Dad. And so I want to know how you're going to win me back. Sorry. It's emotional for you, isn't it? It is emotional. It's a very hard thing to do to, you know, you feel like a traitor to you. It's a mining community. I'm from Cannock in the West Midlands. So it's just, you just feel awful. But I was a Leave voter and... I didn't get from the Labour Party that you were going to support me. All right, well, let's see who can win you back. Let's get our first question, who is for, which is from Paul Noel. Paul. Um, I'm a mental health nurse and a, a trade union rep over in Liverpool. And my question to you is, are we going to be wise um, or, and learn from our mistakes or will we, be, or will we try Corbynism again? Rebecca Long-Bailey. Well, we suffered one of the most devastating defeats that we've seen in 100 years. And we lost seats like this in Dudley North and right across the West Midlands. And there were many reasons for this defeat. 52 out of the 54 seats that we lost were leave seats. But we also need to recognise the other myriad of reasons as to why our voters lost trust in us. We had transformational policies in that manifesto but no message that brought them all together. We weren't trusted on issues such as tackling anti-Semitism, being united as a party, and then there was dealing with media attacks against our leader and indeed the policies themselves. But ultimately, there was Brexit, the elephant in the room. Now, I'm from a Leave constituency, and I could feel the anger from my voters. Many Leave voters thought we were trying to overturn the result of the referendum and weren't respecting their wishes and at the same time we're playing games in Parliament instead of listening to what our communities wanted. And we can't make that mistake again. We saw that that lack of trust took down so many other things with it and we were the party with the policies to make people's lives better. But Paul's but asking you about Corbynism. didn't realise that. Paul is asking about Corbynism. Which bits of Corbynism will you ditch? In terms of the transformational policies, I won't apologise for wanting to make my community's life better and the life of everyone else in the United Kingdom. But for our policies to succeed, we need to have a message that brings people together around aspiration, about raising up everybody's quality of life. And unfortunately, I think in this election campaign, we didn't explain our policies and we didn't prove that we were trying to improve that quality of life. OK, Keir Starmer. Well, the answer to the question is we've got to learn because we're all searching for the reason we lost the last general election 
And we've heard a number of reasons from the audience that we can all take up, and we will. Um, but we've lost four in a row. We've lost four elections in a row, and if we lose the next one, probably in 2024, then the Labour Party, our party, will be out of power for a longer period than any time since the Second World War. Now, if you're in the Labour Party, if you want to lead the Labour Party to change the lives of millions of people for the better, we've got to focus on winning that general election. The four reasons that were given uh, in the contributions earlier were the four that were coming up on the doors, if we're honest about it. Uh, the leadership of the Labour Party, fairly or unfairly, because I do think it was a media campaign that vilified uh, the leader of the Labour Party. Brexit came up, of course it did. It came up in different ways, to be honest, because what was said in places like Dudley was different to what was said in Scotland. Um, so, the, so was that your fault? The, the I'll come back to that. The manifesto overload, um, I think people weren't so much saying, I don't like what's in your manifesto, because there was some good stuff in it. They just thought it had gone to a tipping point where they couldn't believe it. And I'm very sad to say, um, particularly in some areas, anti-Semitism came up, both as a values issue and a competency issue. And we've got to tackle all, each of those, but we've also got to recognise that none of those, on their own, explain why we've lost four in a row. So it's actually an even deeper soul search, I think, uh, than just this idea of identifying one thing that went wrong in the last election. It was always, otherwise it was plain sailing. I personally think is wrong. It's a deeper soul searching than that that we need. But you all say leadership came up. You don't say what was wrong with it. What was wrong with Jeremy Corbyn's leadership? Well, I think, firstly, I do think he was vilified in the press. And certainly when I knocked on doors, what was coming back at me was some of that vilification. So he wasn't wrong? Well, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it came up, and it, part of it came up as vilification. But on Jeremy Corbyn, I think it's fair to say that what he brought to the Labour Party in 2015 was really important because he made it clear that we're a party that opposes cuts to public services, that is anti-austerity, uh, and has a Green New Deal that's hardwired into everything we do. And there's a tendency in political parties or any organisation, when something goes wrong, to say everything must have been wrong then, um, and we better forget it all. Okay. I personally think that's a mistake. We build on the important foundations, but the manifesto that really matters is the one in 2024, we'll get because to we must persuade people with that. Lisa Nandy, will you leave Corbynism behind? Well, I think this is existential for the Labour Party, and I launched my campaign by saying we change or we die. Not with any pleasure, but because I've heard the emotional outpouring that you just gave voice to so perfectly for 10 years now in my constituency in Wigan. And people are looking at us and saying, this is really the last chance. We've been losing for a long time, 2010, 2015, 2017, but 2019 was no ordinary election. Dudley, Sandwell, Stoke, Mansfield, Bolsover, Gedling. These are places where Labour runs through people's DNA as much as their family history. And the fact that we got to the point where we were going round doors with people saying, not you, not now, not this time. That we had people voting Tory in order to tell us that we had to change. That was a real moment for us. We had an unpopular leader, that is true, and we had an unpopular leadership team. Why was he unpopular? He was unpopular for a number of reasons. I think that the main underlying sense was that he just wasn't for people and he wouldn't stand up for people. But let me say this that that comes at the long end of a process that has been happening in the Labour Party for 40 years now. For decades, what we've seen is industry disappearing from many towns across this country, young people having to leave, the scars visible across our high streets and our communities, and in the face of that, a political system that has largely shrugged its shoulders and said, this is progress. I want you to know that I have heard you, and I will make it my mission to bring Labour home to you. Paul, are you, are you hearing what you want to hear here? I am from Lisa, yeah. I, th I think we, we need to move it forward. I was knocking on doors in West Wirral and uh, people were saying exactly the same. They were just totally, totally disheartened. Uh, and it did get quite, it got quite upsetting. Do you know, after street after street, you were getting told that people didn't want to vote for Labour anymore. And Rebecca Long Bailey, to... is there one policy that you would drop? From this manifesto? Well, there were a number of policies that weren't deliverable within no, but five years. Is there one years. you would drop? There's not one that I would drop, and I'll explain why. Because there were policies that were deliverable within five years that would go into the manifesto. So, Green Industrial Revolution, for example, investing in our education service. But there were other policies that were part of a longer term vision. So, the four day week is a, a critical example of that. We'd never have achieved that in five years. It was a long term aspiration after we'd improved productivity through investing in an industrial strategy and when we'd secured trade union representation in our workplaces 
but putting it in the manifesto and packaging it in a way that we could deliver it under an ex-government confused people. And I think that's where we need to so rethink... So it's just packaging? Re exactly. Rethink the way that we package our policies. But I just want to come back on a point that, uh, that's been made about continuing Corbynism. And I'd say this to any Labour voter or Labour Party member. There's no such thing as Corbynism. There's our Labour values. If we believe in building more council homes, investing in our futures through education and industrial strategy, that's okay. socialism. That's not Corbynism, and we shouldn't throw away those policies. OK, hold, hold that thought. A very timely question now from Tamika Smith, who's from Birmingham. Uh, following on from Caroline Flack's death, what do you think that says about modern Britain? Keir Starmer. Was it, what do you think of modern Britain? I didn't... Following on from Caroline Flack's death... Yes. ..what do you think it says about modern Britain? Well, I think, firstly, it's tragic, and all of our thoughts, I think, have to go to her, her friends and her family. I think it really shook the whole nation. Uh, I think it tells us a lot about social media and about the media. There is just uh, yards of abuse on social media, and it's about time that those that provide the platform took responsibility for what's on it. This has been going on a long time, there's abuse, there's hatred, and it's not only Caroline's case, there are youngsters that are committing suicide as well because of what's on social media. Now, I worked, when I was Director of Public Prosecutions, we were trying to persuade social media to take responsibility, and their response was, unless it's to do with terrorism, we're not going to do so. That has got to change now. Um, and I think the mainstream media as well has to stop amplifying it because they've been amplifying it. So I think this, this shines a torch, really, into the soul of the nation in terms of how we interact with, with each other on social media. There have been many questions about why the CPS was prosecuting her when her former partner wasn't supporting that prosecution. As a former head of, uh, of public prosecutions, can you explain that? No, of course I can't, because I've not been the director of public prosecutions for 10 years. But should I've it be no looked idea. into? Well, I've... I'm not going to make the mistake, Absolutely. 10 years out of office, of now commenting on a file I've never seen and the circumstances I don't know. I'm also not going to make the mistake of attributing whatever this, what's behind this tragedy to one thing. I don't know why this happened and I don't want to pretend I know. Should anyone look into that? Well, of course. I mean, I'm sure there will be an inquest and people will look into it. But, but one thing I... And one thing I think is wrong, and people in all sorts of walks of life do this, they do a job and then five, ten years, fifteen year, year, years later, they pretend they know what was on the file of the person who's looking at it at the moment, and that's the wrong thing to do. But also, th there's a wide range of possible reasons why this tragedy happened, and I'm not going to presume that it's one and not the other. This is tragic, and, I, and for the family, I think the last thing they want is people like me coming on and pontificating about what may or may not have been the... Let's just give them the space they need to grieve, of course then there'll Absolutely. be an investigation into what, what happened, and rightly so, but let's just be a bit human about this. Absolutely. Lisa Nandy. <laughs> and, and bear in mind that her former management company have been very critical of that particular topic, which is why we're raising it. Yeah, well, let me support Keir on that, because I, don't, I didn't know Caroline, and I don't want to speculate or make anything worse for her family. I've had deaths in my constituency, often in very difficult circumstances, over the last 10 years, and the last thing people need is me speculating. What I will say is that there is, it is very difficult to be in public life at the moment, um, because there is an unkindness that's crept into our public debate that I think is detrimental to all of us. And actually, that isn't just felt in public life. It's also felt by a lot of people living out their lives in our communities. So a few years ago, there was a case of a mum with a son with disabilities who felt she had no choice but to kill herself and her son. And it turned out in that case that there'd been sustained bullying and harassment of that family for a long time with very little support. So I think we need to do two things. The first is that we need to step in and provide much greater support to people across this country. We all go through hard times in our lives. We're all going to need extra help. We need to be really clear that that is not a weakness. Asking for help is a strength. And when you ask, you'll get that support. And secondly, I think we need to start challenging the public discourse in this country. It's not just that it is abusive and unkind. It's also that we found multiple ways in the last decade to divide ourselves from each other. We're a better country than that would have us believe. Let's pull together and move forwards together. Rebecca Long-Bailey. Is there, are there specific things government should do about this beyond exhorting people to be better people? 
definitely. And I don't want to comment on, on the case of Caroline other than to say that I'm shocked and that my thoughts are with her friends and family. I know they wanted their privacy to be respected. But there's a huge issue to look at in terms of online bullying and social media companies and the way that the press, certainly the tabloids, respond to that and amplify that. I think we need to ensure that the government put pressure on the social media companies to tackle online abuse on their platforms. But I also think that the government needs to press ahead with the second stage of the Leveson inquiry about examining the role of the media within society in a free press, but also upholding ethical and moral principles. And you know, I'd say this because we have become um, certainly not in our interactions physically with each other, but certainly online, we've became quite an abrasive society when you look at the likes of Twitter. I'll have a whole ream of stuff to read when I go online later on that I probably shouldn't look at. But it costs nothing to be kind. And that comes from leadership, both in government and both in public life. We're better than that. We know that's not what our society represents. How do you feel when you go online and read that? Sometimes it's funny, some people are obsessed with my eyebrows. One guy did a ruler, a picture of my eyebrows and a ruler, because I've got quite expressive eyebrows, and said, look how far away Rebecca's eyebrows are from her face. <laughs> I, I just want to um, pick up on what Beck is saying, because it is really important. This hatred, this division, actually also puts people off putting themselves forward to do anything in public life. So many people I know say, I'm not going to step up and do anything. Um, because I fear this abuse and this hatred. And so it isn't only corrosive and divisive in itself and bitter, it really affects people, leads to suicides, and actually it puts good people off putting themselves forward, um, and it means that we don't have all the talent we should have in all the places we should have them. OK, we, we must move on. <laughs> We're going to move on to another topic that has really gripped this Labour leadership debate, perhaps surprisingly. Um, the question is from Moira Hampton, who's from Leicester. Uh, and who says she voted Labour in every election since 1979. Moira. Thank you. Does the trans rights issue um, potentially... Uh, could it possibly lead to division and possible alienation of female voters? Is it just perhaps another issue of unity? Lisa Nandy, well, you have signed this pledge mm -hmm. um, <coughs> that is very controversial, and this weekend at a... At a meeting, you were asked, would a, would a person convicted of uh, child rape, who now identifies as a woman, be better in a female prison? Yeah. And you said yes. Yeah, well, I said that people have the right to self-define, and that if you've self-defined, then you have the right to be in the prison that matches your gender. But what you don't have the right to do is put other people at risk of harm. We've never had violent offenders allowed to be in prison with non-violent offenders, putting them at risk. And actually, I think this is a really important moment for us as a party, because I represent a constituency in Wigan with a very high rate of domestic violence. I understand clearly and loudly the need of women in this country for safe spaces not just when they're at immediate risk but for a lot of the women that i represent because they will always feel at times at risk of harm and this is important and when i worked for the charity center point we spent a lot of time grappling with the issues of how we got not just the policies but the practices in place to keep the young people in our hostels safe from people who would want to harm them but i do not accept that this has to become a zero-sum game against the rights of people who I also represent in Wigan, a young person going through the Gender Recognition Act process at the moment, who is being bullied and stigmatised, whose family, every time I see them, I'm not sure are going to survive for much longer, with very little support, who need every ounce of empathy and compassion that I can muster. So is it transphobic to want um, what are called safe spaces for women that exclude trans women who, who identify as women, but who may still have male genitalia, for example. It's not at all transphobic to want safe spaces, and we have to take the heat out of this conversation and cast a little more light on it. For most people, there will be ways of providing safe spaces that are inclusive, and we can navigate our way through the complexities of this in a way that is decent and respectful to all sides. But let me just say this but as well. But why you signed a pledge that, that we, says... No, let me, let, sorry, Christian, let me just say this as well, is that there's been a tendency in the Labour Party, and actually in public debate generally in recent years, 
to go straight from 0 to 60 at the beginning of a debate and say, this is here, this is there, you pick a side, and, and whichever side you're on, we're going to argue it out until one side wins and the other side is crushed. We are better than that as a party. And part of me standing for the leadership of this party is about standing up for the level of public debate we deserve. We can do better than this. Right, but you and Rebecca Long-Bailey have signed a pledge that supports the expulsion from the Labour Party of those who express bigoted transphobic views, and it defines various organisations such as Woman's Place, which calls for women's safe spaces, as transphobic. So, I, so the, can, I, can I just address that point directly? Because I think there are people in those organisations who will be perfectly considered and respectful towards others. And the only bit of that pledge that gave me pause for thought was about prescribing organisations. It's individual behaviour that matters. Okay. And if you, if you are someone who wants to have a challenging discussion about providing safe spaces, that is absolutely right Rebecca and proper. Long and I welcome that in the party. But if you're someone who denies the right of trans people to exist then no meaningful dialogue is possible. Rebecca Long-Bailey, these organisations want safe spaces, what they, what they describe as. Do you think that they should be expelled from the Labour Party? Not at all, no, and there's no incompatibility with trying to stand up for the rights of trans people and trying to stand up for the rights of women and protecting them in safe spaces. That, that is enshrined under the Equality well, Act, and there's no plan to, think that there is. to change that in any way. But what we have been talking about in this debate, and I want to take the toxicity out of this, is recognising the often long and dehumanising process that many of our trans community have to go to in order to identify as either a trans man or a trans woman. And that relates to the Gender Recognition Act and making that process less dehumanising. The trans community have been subject to abuse and vilification, comes off the back of the topic we were just discussing, um, for a long time. And the Labour Party stands against abuse and vilification of any part of our community. Trans rights are human rights. The Gender Recognition Act was a step in the right direction, but it's clear that we need to go further than that. Other countries have gone further, and I think we can go further. But we're not going to make progress here if we treat this as a political football batted around by different parts within our party or the wider movement. We owe it to the trans community and to everybody else to grow up on this and have a better debate about how we go forward. Why did you not sign this particular pledge that the other two have? What did you see as a problem in it? I, I signed the LGBT plus the Labour um, pledge on this, which I thought pitched it right. Um, and I don't want this to be a political football. I'm not suggesting those behind the other pledge have got anything other than the best of intentions. Do you think there's anything wrong with that other pledge that you didn't sign? You're tempting me to do the very thing I'm saying we shouldn't do. <laughs> Th this is a really well, serious... Well, you've made a choice about which pledge to sign, and I'm trying to work out This why. is a very serious issue with a community that clearly need the law to be extended and better protection. Let's have a proper debate about that rather than who signed which pledge. That isn't helping in this debate. Absolutely. It's treating it as if there are two, no, three, four rival This particular rival pledge, as you know, is Christian, controversial because I'm not, I'm of this not, question of expulsion. I'm and not, I'm wondering whether that's why you didn't sign it. I'm not going to get into this slippery, slidey slope where then we're in conflict with each other. We are running positively as candidates to lead the Labour Party. We're trying not to take lumps out of each other and attack each other publicly. If we can do that, I think that stands or in privately. good stead. Or privately. <laughs> but it stands in good... What people in... What our party and our movement, and I think our country wants, is a united Labour Party that looks like it can go into government. If we can model that in the way we treat each other in these debates and in this leadership contest, I think that is a good thing. And it's a tribute, I would say, uh, to, to both of the other candidates that we've managed to do that so far. Can I... Let's briefly find out what a couple of people in the audience make of this. Um, how about you? What do you think about this what particular is issue on trans rights? I believe that safe spaces of women are really important. Not to say that trans people and trans women are, don't deserve to be protected, but I feel like if we're taking away from women, then they're probably not going to be able to speak out and a lot more cases of domestic violence and sexual assault won't go reported. What about you, Yadjihanda? As a Labour Party member, I would just like clarity from Keir as to why he didn't sign the pledge. Well, I think he's, he said why he's not going to... That address that particular question, so we, we, we won't go back to him on that. Um, but we'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's hear from two people now who want to question the candidates on the subject of money. First, Peter Lathwood, a lifelong Labour voter from Stourbridge. Peter. Hello. 
How would your key economic policies differ, if at all, from those in the last Labour manifesto? OK, and related to that, Katerina Goncalves, who's a student from Redditch. Thank you. What is your plan to tackle the wealth gap between the rich and poor? Keir Starmer. Uh, let me take the first question and then the second one. I think in the last manifesto we had a lot about solidarity, and the Labour Party stands for solidarity with people who need our solidarity, and rightly so. But I don't think we had enough about opportunity. We characterised everybody as either the 1% at the top, the elite rigging everything, or those with absolutely nothing. And there's a vast gap in between, um, and it's called opportunity. And that is the Labour dream. Uh, my dad worked in a factory, my mum was a nurse, and the Labour dream for them was that the next generation would have better opportunities. And I think that we need to rebuild that part of our narrative, our core message to people, because I think they, for years and years and years, that sustained the Labour Party, this sense that the next generation would have better opportunities. And it slipped away in the last 10 years. Um, so far as the second question is uh, concerned, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And yet the economy clearly isn't working for people. It clearly isn't. You've got insecure jobs, low-paid jobs. You've got regional inequality, which is really, really deep. Um, and what we're doing with our economy is damaging the environment. And that has to be tackled head-on um, by an incoming Labour government by saying there's got to be a fundamental shift of power, resource and opportunity. Um, and I would make that central to my economic thinking. Lisa and Andy. I think if you want to make the sort of fundamental change that I do in this country, where you have proper public services and people who don't fear growing old or their parents growing old without dignity or care, then you have to be honest with people about how you're going to pay for it. And we all stood on a manifesto that said we would put 5% on the top rate of income tax. That seems right to me, that those who can pay the most do so. But actually, if you look at where the wealthy put their money, it's in assets. So at a very minimum, we ought to be saying that we will bring wealth taxes into line with income taxes so we don't just keep squeezing working people. Secondly, I think we need a different relationship with business. I said this week that I wanted to introduce a social licence for business, because how can it possibly be that you have workers in Dunfermline sleeping in tents who work for Amazon, while last week Jeff Bezos bought a $165 million mansion with his loose change. We've got to support good businesses who do make a contribution, who do tackle climate change, who do support their workforce by introducing a social licence so that those who don't face pet real penalties for it. And finally, we've got to do something about the hidden poverty taxes in this country. It costs more to be poor for your insurance, for your credit rating, just even to access your own money through a cash machine. It costs far more to be poor. So we've got to come at this from both ends and show people that we're there for them at the most difficult times of their lives. Rebecca Long-Bailey. Do you know, I was on the train on the way here tonight and I was talking to a young lad sat next to me from Lancaster and he was going all the way down to the south coast. He was about 20 and he got a job as an electrician on a rig and he was so excited. He was realising his aspirations and I got off the train and I was dead happy for him and then I got really depressed because his story isn't true of many people here in Dudley. I think unemployment is twice the national rate at the moment. Qualification rates are below national average. We've got the most regional, regionally unequal country in the whole of Western Europe. Our economy is not working. So of all the candidates, I've got a plan to fix that. I've talked about having a real and comprehensive industrial strategy to re-industrialise places like the West Midlands and create the jobs of the future. I've talked about investing in homes, council homes and private homes to spur on the renewed prosperity that we need to see. I've talked about a cradle-to-grave education service to make sure that whatever age you are, wherever you are in life, you have the opportunity to aspire and to do well in life. They're the foundations of revitalising our economy. And that's the only way we'll see prosperity increase here in the United uh, Kingdom. Keir Starmer, does Rebecca Long-Bailey really have something over you on this? I mean, she's suggesting she's the one with the plans. No, I don't think so. I think we're all putting forward our plans. And what <laughs> we're saying is that um, the case we're making is what we think is right for our party, our movement and for our 
country. Of course there's a massive overlap. If you take an issue like Amazon earning, I think, £10.9 billion in revenue last year and paying 2% tax, I suspect the three of us are going to say the, the same thing about it. That so do you think you fundamentally agree with could each I, other on the economy? I, could, I, could I say where I think that there is a difference? Because I agree with Keir. I think on all of those things we do fundamentally agree. But I've spent the last 10 years, including the last three, off the front bench and in the country trying to build a plan back for places like Dudley. And actually Actually, I think there is far more going for Dudley than you just heard. I think there is huge potential here, real assets, not least the warmth and the pride and the skill and the commitment of the people in this community, which matches my home in Wigan. And what I want to see is not just a plan conceived and executed by a small group of people behind a desk in central London, but real power going out to those areas so that we can decide for ourselves where that investment goes, how that money is spent and get the jobs in here that we need. Just, just briefly. We can, we can talk about the ills of our broken economic model and what needs to change, but we need to have a comprehensive plan because it's not enough talking about a plan. You have to have worked up the detail. And I've spent the last four years working behind the scenes on that detail, whether it was our green industrial revolution, whether it was our industrial strategy, a plan for our steel sector, investing in our automotive industry. Okay. I was creating the jobs of the future, and I'm devastated that we didn't win this general election, because I know that prospects for people here in Dudley would have been very different to what they are today. Um, right, I, I just want to get on to some quick fire questions very briefly about policy and a couple of other things as well that might shed a little bit of light on where you're coming from on, on some of those other issues. Um, so we'll go from Rebecca first. Uh, would you decriminalise cannabis? No, but I think we need to have a conversation nationally about this because the quick war fire on is drugs yes or isn't no. working. So no is fine. OK, so one or two words. Keir Starmer. Would you decriminalise cannabis? I wouldn't immediately. I have supported schemes where cannabis possession is not arrested. You're not arrested for okay. it, you're not prosecuted for it, and I, I, I believe in that. No, let's have a proper review. Thank you. Uh, yes or no, um, in a, or not yes or no, but one word. In a referendum on keeping the monarchy, would you vote to keep it or scrap it? Lisa Nandy. Um, well, I'm, I'm a Democrat, so I would vote to scrap it. But actually, let me just say, I know it's no, a quick fire it. round, it. but it, this is not the priority as a country. We've just lost, left the EU without any yeah. kind of plan okay. about where we go we next. We get that. It's not top priority, but in a referendum. Keir Starmer. No, I wouldn't. I think I'd downsize it. And by the way, it didn't come up on the doorsteps. We've been talking about why we, left the refer why we lost the election, what we need to do next. This isn't one of the priorities okay. for the leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> Rebecca Long-Bailey. I think we've got more important things to worry Absolutely. about, so no, I wouldn't. Yeah, but how would you you vote? I wouldn't vote Keep to abolish scrap. the monarchy. You'd, you wouldn't vote to no. abolish the monarchy? I'd quite like to see Queen Meghan at some point. Okay, fine, <laughs> right. This is a yes or no. Would you still provide free broadband for all? Keir Starmer. See, the problem with these yes, no... <laughs> I mean, they really are problem. Because behind that question lies something massive, which is for ten years there's been an ambition to have broadband across the United Kingdom, and it hasn't happened. Um, and something needs to be done about it. So um, we need a, a more grown-up debate about this than just yes, no, rapid fire, quite frankly. Well, it comes down to yes or no, whether you put it in well, your manifesto. Krishnan, we, we go, we're going to go on strike if you we, keep this up. <laughs> Rebecca Long Bailey, free broadband or not? Well, I'm rubbish at these yes/no questions. I think there's. Well, a it was wide, one of your policies. A, Do you want to keep it, it was, or not? Well, I agree with the broadband policy because we were investing in upgrading our economy and improving productivity, and as a result, we were including people who couldn't afford broadband. So I do support the principle, but I think we need to explain it better to our voters. Lisa and Andy. So digital infrastructure is really, really central in this country. When my friends come to visit me from London, they just cannot believe that I have to go and stand Quick at the end of a road answer. to get a signal. Um, so um, I think it's a really important policy, but let's remember the language of priorities. I'd is that start, yes? I'd start with buses before broadband. But is that a yes? <laughs> it's, a, it's a later. It's a maybe. All right. Fine. Uh, last one, um, and I want a, a, a name for this. Um, who is the greatest Labour leader of the last 50 years? Ooh. Rebecca Long-Bailey. Oh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you have to say Clement Attlee because it was the last most transformational years. Labour government. Oh, I don't know. 
That's since 1970. My favourite MP was Frank Cullorn, I'll give you that. He was the MP for Salford. Right, you don't have an answer. OK, Keir Starmer, do you have an answer? <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted to go for Wilson because he managed to get all of the party to come in behind him and unite him, and I think we need a bit of that going forward. Um, but again, but of course, all Labour leaders have brought things to our party that matter in different ways, and that, I mean, we're all, I think we are going to go on strike for yes, no, we'll we, we guys. We absolutely <laughs> are. Greatest Labour leader of the last um, 50 years, that's since 1970, so no Clement Attlee. Well, I'm hoping that we're about to elect her in a few weeks' time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. If not, you get a about, bonus point how, for clever How answer. about this? The greatest Labour leader that never was, Barbara Castle. <laughs> okay, worth, worth mentioning, everybody, that of course, in the Ashcroft poll um, of Labour members, they said it was Jeremy Corbyn, and of ordinary voters, they said it was Tony Blair. Two names that didn't come up at all uh, from our three leadership candidates. I want to hear from the audience now. Uh, we've got in our audience people who were Labour voters but who deserted the party at the last election. What do you make of what you're hearing? Graham, you, you left Labour at the last yeah, I election. Um, I voted Lib Dem this time, and uh, frankly, it was because of the leadership. And I really did think that you were not going to win anyway. Um, but but are heard, you hearing anything tonight? I've heard like? from the three candidates tonight, all very good candidates, but I'm looking for the candidate who is going to, once they've been elected, move towards the centre, because that is where the votes are. They're not hard on the left, they're in the centre. So I'm wondering which one of those three is going to do that. Okay. And I think, I think it's Keir Starmer, but that's personal view. Thank you. Um, well, do you want to just briefly... Is it you, Keir Starmer? Are you the person who's going to move the party back to the centre? I'm the person that wants to unite our party to be the most effective opposition we can possibly be and to forge our path to victory at the next general election. Uh, and they're my three priorities, so that we can actually win this country and change this country for the better, which I suspect and I hope would persuade you to vote Labour again. OK. Um, how about you? you? You also left the party at the last election. Yes, I did. That's the first time I have ever voted none other than Labour. This is not just me, a lot of the Asians around our Sandoval area, Tom Watson area. The main issue was anti-Semitism. Can I get commitment from you that that's going to be your first priority to sort that out? That has upset every community. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, it came up on every door that I knocked on as well in many different constituencies around the country. And the reason, I think, is because it's existential for the Labour Party. We, we're the party that gave this country the Race Relations Act. If we want to go out and build a more compassionate, fairer, equal society, free from discrimination, we have to live those values ourselves. I, I, I absolutely take your point. And we got this on the doorstep. If you're anti-Semitic, you shouldn't be in the Labour Party. It's as simple as that. Uh, and if I were leader, if I were leader of the Labour Party, I'd make it my personal responsibility to deal with this, because leadership makes a massive difference in this. If the leader of the party takes a clear stand and says, I want to see the cases on my desk, I've, I've run a big organisation, I know what it's like when you have a line of sight on something that really matters, and I'd make it my business uh, to move this on uh, and also to rebuild the relations with the Jewish community, Rebecca because we have to do that before we, we get an audience uh, to be able to talk about anything else. Well, look, we're the party of Harold Lasky, the Lever Brothers and Frank Alorn, who I said was my favourite MP. So it was devastating in this election campaign to knock on doors and find that many within the Jewish community just didn't trust us anymore. And I hope that all of us, and I think we all will, will take robust action on anti-Semitism because we haven't dealt with it properly within the party. We've got to adopt all of the EHRC's recommendations when they report back to the party. I think we need to have an independent complaints process for all forms of discrimination, not just anti-Semitism, that speeds the process up and that people have faith in. And I think that we need to rebuild trust by educating our membership on this issue and also reaching out to the Jewish community and their organisations. Just on this very briefly, did either of you who have served in the Shadow Cabinet consider resigning over this matter? And if not, why not? I mean, you think what Jeremy Corbyn tried to introduce was anti-Semitic. Why didn't you resign over this? I, th what, I thought that he's, what, he was trying to introduce anti-Semitic. Yeah, the, the quotation that was put to you about Israel the foundation of Israel being a racist endeavour. Well, that under, you believe that, well, that wasn't, is anti Because I, I have looked at what Jeremy actually said, and saying that Israel is a racist endeavour is anti-Semitic under the IRA definitions. Which but he questioning to bring in. the actions of any government 
and saying that their policies are racist is a different story. The British government and their treatment of the Windrush generation, for example, that's a racist policy. Okay. You'd expect us to do that as Chris a I mean, shouldn't you have left? I, I took the decision that I had to speak out against it publicly, which I did, and speak out against it in the Shadow Cabinet, which I did. And I think um, that's very important. Lisa, of course, was outside of the Shadow Cabinet. She spoke up against it publicly. I, spoke I did, I, I I did spoke both. Up, I, uh, I, did, I did both, actually. I spoke up against oh, sorry, it when I, I was mean. in the Shadow Cabinet. And I, uh, one of the reasons that I didn't return to the Shadow Cabinet is because I got the very strong impression from the leadership of the party that we were not going to take this seriously. And when I was forced to choose, I stood with the Jewish community in solidarity because that was the right thing to do. Okay. <laughs> yes. My name is Vida Sampson and I work for the NHS a long time ago. I also work in residential and I now give my time to the homeless by cooking them a hot meal. And you know, it is terrible to know that people in this country, which is so rich and there's some lovely people in this country, we need to work with each other. And the main thing that is lacking is communication. We need to go back to the community and see how it worked in the beginning. And if it takes, doesn't matter how long and doesn't matter who, whether you're a man or a woman or you come from the North Pole, this is what we need to do to get our country going. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, right, who's got a question? I mean, it's gonna to have to be a quick one. Yes, here. We've spoken rightfully a lot about anti-Semitism, but what about the rights of the Palestinian people? And I want to hear what you guys think of that. Right. We're going to have to be brief on this. <laughs> um, rights of the Palestinian people, one second. Um, sorry, Krishna, we're all revolting. No, I mean, it's frustrating, I know. I know. No, OK, so I've been the uh, vice chair and chair of Labour Friends of Palestine in the Middle East for eight of the ten years that I've been in Parliament. And it has never been impossible to stand up for the rights of pa the Palestinian people whilst not being anti-Semitic. That is the plain truth. You can do both. You can stand for a two-state solution, for the rights of the Palestinians and for the right of Israel to exist. Can I just say this as well, though, that this, that contribution just there is exactly the country that I believe in and it's the country that I know we are and we can be and we are a better country than Boris Johnson would have us believe and that is why Labour has to go out with boldness and ambition and courage because we know we're better than this and we've got to take the fight out into the country win the argument get into government and change this situation for good. Kirstama. We can stand up and we should stand up for Palestinian rights um, and that can perfectly well be done without being anti-semitic. This, th these two things are not in conflict, and the suggestion that they are is just wrong, I think. But you're absolutely right to raise this, because we do have a dispossessed, dispossessed uh, Palestinian uh, people, and we have an insecure Israel, and, and I don't think anybody can pretend that this is a state of affairs that is possibly right in the world, uh, and we need to do something about it. I did just also want to comment on your contribution, and thank you so much for that, just about the spirit in which we have to come together. And but also... No, and, because uh, I owe that uh, and I think to the community. The, 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 the challenge for our party, the immediate challenge, is whether we can pull together, um, stop taking lumps out of each other, stop dividing, and actually recognise the incredible force we are. We're 580,000 members, the biggest political party in Europe. What an unstoppable force we could be if we united uh, as, as that fighting force, ready to fight that next general election. Rebecca Lombardi. Standing up for the rights of Palestinians is the right thing for our party to do, and we've always done that. And I believe in a secure Israel alongside a viable state of Palestine. But I also think that the conflict must be settled on the basis of international law, human rights and social justice. 80% of Palestinians are reliant on humanitarian aid. So we should continue calling for an end to the blockade and the illegal settlements that we see in the Palestinian West Bank and in Gaza. And I'll never apologise for standing up for the rights of Palestinian people, but at no point should it ever be conflated with anti-Semitism. There should always be two separate issues. And there, with all those hands still up, I'm very sorry, we are out of time. We are going to have to leave it. I'd like to thank our audience here in Dudley for their questions and their attendance and their 
Respect for everyone in the room. Thank you to our candidates who joined us here in Dudley. Voting to decide which one of them becomes leader starts next Monday. The result will be revealed on April the 4th. From all of us here, a very good night.